Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Woo You event. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Kathleen G, and she's going to be discussing managing refractive surgery complications. Next slide. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. G. She is a board-certified ophthalmologist specializing in cataract and refractive surgery at the Cleveland Eye Clinic. She grew up in Maryland, where she stayed for most of her training. She graduated summa cum laude from the University of Maryland with a bachelor's degree in bioengineering, followed by a medical degree at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She completed a residency at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins University, and is, which is widely recognized as one of the top programs in the country. Dr. G has received many awards and honors, presented her research findings at national conferences, and published numerous peer-reviewed articles in ophthalmology. Her focus lies in cataract and refractive surgery, and she's performed thousands of vision correctness surgeries and is a proud and happy refractive surgery patient herself, having undergone ICL procedure. So we're excited to hear from you and all of the knowledge that you have to offer us. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, here are financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated. All right, I'll have you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Serenzi, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, before I go ahead and get started on the topic at hand, I just want to preface our discussion tonight by saying that Refractive surgery um, is a, we have wonderful options and technologies, fortunately, for our patients. And many of our patients are very happy with great and successful outcomes. But like any surgery, there are minor risks that um, can happen during surgery. And so it's important that we know how to identify and manage these, you know, relatively infrequent complications. And so that's what we're going to go ahead and focus on today. So um, I'm just going to do a quick overview of refractive surgery, and then we'll dive into complications of refractive surgery and how we can go ahead and manage those. So in general, when we think of refractive surgery, we can really subdivide it into two general categories. There is corneal refractive surgery, like PRK, LASIK, and SMILE. And then we have lens-based procedures, such as custom lens replacement and phagic lenses. So just a quick overview, um, as we are all familiar with corneal-based refractive surgery, we have PRK or photorefractive keratectomy, which is a surface ablation procedure where the epithelium is removed and an eczema laser reshapes the cornea. And then it does take time for the epithelium to grow, but patients do very well with this procedure. LASIK um, provides a faster visual recovery. We use two lasers, a femtosecond laser to create a thin corneal flap which is then lifted up to <clears throat> for the eczema laser to treat the cornea, removing prescription, and the LAS LASIK flap comes back down. Um, and then newer to us is SMILE, also known as small incision lenticule extraction. Here, a femtosecond laser is used to um, basically dissect or carve out a, uh, a it's kind of like a contact lens shape um, disc of the cornea that conforms to the patient's prescription. And it's removed through a very small incision. It's about four millimeters. So it is a little less invasive than let's say LASIK. And it's a very nice option for patients who qualify for this procedure. Lens-based refractive surgery, we have phacic lenses and custom lens replacement. Uh, the phacic lens is a very nice option for patients who may not be the best candidates for a corneal procedure. For example, patients who have a high prescription, high myopia, perhaps a little too much than is uh, safe to remove from the cornea. Um, maybe they have a thin pachymetry to begin with, and it's not the best idea to proceed with a corneal-based procedure. The advantage here is that we do not touch the cornea. We actually implant a lens inside the eye. So this leads to less aberrations, perhaps less surface issues or dryness. Um, it is re removable. Eventually it will have to be removed at the time of cataract surgery in any case, but if for whatever reason the size is not correct or it rotates, it can be repositioned and removed and replaced with a different lens. The disadvantage of the phacic lenses, well, in the current at the current moment, um, there is no hyperopic uh, treatment for uh, phacic lenses, at least not in the United States. Um, there's also not truly a presbyopic option there. 
Unlike corneal procedures, this is an intraocular procedure, so there are slight increased risks related to that. Um, the cost is higher than a corneal procedure. And this is less of an issue with the current iteration of the ICL, but depending on sizing, there can be minor risks related to cataract formation, pressure issues, or potentially endothelial cell uh, loss. Uh, in the United States, we are primarily using the EVO ICL, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, it is a lens that gets implanted. It lays in front of the natural crystalline lens and just behind the iris. It has a central port, very small, that, to allow for aqueous flow. So we do not need to use a peripheral iridotomy. Um, it allows for uh, aqueous to flow and to prevent pupillary block that was potentially an issue with the first generation ICL. Um, and it's a very nice uh, technology where we don't have to do that peripheral iridotomy anymore. It can correct myopia from minus three to minus 15 diopters and astigmatism up to four diopters. And then lastly, we have custom lens replacement, which is a very nice option. Um, for patients uh, before they need cataract surgery to help them reduce or eliminate their refractive error, especially in patients with kind of higher or extreme prescriptions, for example, high hyperopes or high myopes who maybe don't qualify for the ICL or patients with uh, high astigmatism. It is an intraocular procedure, so of course there are going to be the typical risks with this. Um, and it is also important to discuss with patients the risk of a retinal detachment, which is slightly higher for myope, higher myopes, and also if there is not yet a presence of a posterior vitreous detachment. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and focus now on the heart of our uh, discussion tonight, which is going to be the comp complications and management of refractive surgery. And we can kind of divide complications into kind of optical and then structural or corneal or lenticular issues. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with that. So overcorrection and undercorrection. Um, you know, in in general, with uh, the use of nomograms, this is pretty rare, but it can happen. Um, I would say the number one reason for a patient to be either over or undercorrected um, is the re preoperative refraction may not have been the most accurate. And so that's why it's critical that the refraction is done as accurately as possible, um, making sure that we're not over minusing the patient. Um, on the other hand, also making sure that we're uncovering any latent hyperopia and knowing what the true prescription is so that we can make sure that we know what, what should be properly treated. Um, but in general, you know, aside from perhaps not the most accurate preoperative refraction, um, there are other reasons why a patient may be overcorrected. Uh, specifically, you know, in general, when you're doing refractive surgery like LASIK or PRK, it's important to be relatively efficient during the procedure because if you leave the stromal bed exposed for a prolonged period of time, that leads to stromal dehydration. And this, the cornea, a dehydrated cornea kind of picks up the eczema laser more and this can have more of an uh, refractive impact and overcorrect uh, the patient. So for example, when the LASIK flap is lifted up or when the epithelium is removed in PRK and the stromal bed is exposed, you wanna make sure you're doing the eczema laser as quickly as possible to prevent stromal dehydration. It's also really important that the temperature in the room for the laser, as well as the humidity is appropriate for the laser because if it's too high or too low, this can impact the accuracy of the laser. In terms of undercorrection, um, we talked about already, you know, incorrect refraction, um, but there can also be kind of spontaneous regression that we, we can see. Um, in general, with nomograms, like I mentioned, they're pretty accurate, and most patients are going to be well within, you know, a half to one diopter of the intended target. Um, but, you know, let's say there is an under or over correction. Well, fortunately, we can go ahead and enhance the patient. Generally, it's recommended that we wait about three to six months for uh, refractive stability before moving forward. Um, but that fortunately is an option for our patients. Okay, so next we'll go ahead and discuss dry eye. You know, I like to think that dry eye, number one, is common regardless of surgery. Um, and it's kind of an expected part of the healing process, especially for corneal refractive surgery. Number one, it's really important to identify and treat 
dry eye preoperatively. Um, so we want to make sure that we're looking at the cornea, looking for any staining, and treat as we normally would um, to optimize the surface prior to any corneal surgery. It's also important because if a patient has significant dry eye, perhaps they're not the best candidate for corneal refractive surgery. Um, and so if we don't look ahead of time, we're not, you know, there can be an exacerbated issue on the post-operative side of things. So I definitely um, highly encourage you to um, check for this preoperatively. But the main reason why dry eye is prevalent after corneal refractive surgery is because we are using a laser to cut into the cornea. And this will sever corneal nerves and lead to corneal denervation, which can take several months to regenerate. And so in that time, you know, patients often will have you know, typical dry eye symptoms, which we counsel them on ahead of time. So they know, and they're going to be using artificial tears uh, fairly frequently, which helps to mitigate the symptoms. And for most people, they do recover back to baseline after, you know, anywhere from three to six months um, and do just fine. But let's say a patient is still, you know, having symptoms, we can in addition to tear drops, consider the use of punctal plugs, stronger drops like cyclosporine, um, and things of that nature. The other thing that's helpful to differentiate is between true dryness, where we see maybe corneal staining, um, versus something called uh, surgical temporary ocular discomfort syndrome, or STODs. And this kind of alludes to the fact that because the corneal nerves are cut during surgery, there it does take time. And sometimes we can have that pain, no stain type uh, presentation. And so, you know, fortunately, this is temporary and doesn't last that long. And there are ways to kind of alleviate symptoms while this process heals itself. But on rare occasion, we can have chronic um, issues, for example, corneal neuralgia or some type of neuropathic pain that doesn't seem to want to resolve in a timely fashion. In this case, we might need to escalate therapy, for example, the use of um, autologous serum tears um, or perhaps even neuromodulators. Fortunately, corneal neuralgia is very rare. Um, regression can happen as well. So we might see this perhaps a few years after uh, refractive surgery, and there can be uh, a number of different causes for this. So it's important if a patient, let's say, presents a few years after having some type of procedure that we do a full exam to kind of elucidate what might be going on. Um, this does tend to happen in the higher prescription, so the more tissue ablated um, or higher uh, preoperative spherical equivalent. Uh, prescription, we can see regression more commonly. Um, so what are some causes? Uh, one important cause is epithelial hyperplasia. So over time, the epithelium can become a little bit more thicker than normal, which can lead to a refractive uh, shift. You know, corneal tasia is pretty rare, but could lead to, you know, uh, either myopic shift or you know, astigmatism. So it'll be important to elucidate that. You know, cataract formation can lead to um, uh, refractive shifts um, and corneal haze. So how will we want to evaluate this? So it's important to get a corneal topography um, and even tomography. Um, look at pachymetry. This can help us determine if there's any ectasia. An epithelial map will be really helpful to assess for epithelial hyperplasia and just a standard lamp examination to look at the cornea as well as the, the lens itself. If let's say there's corneal haze, you know, you can treat that with the use of steroids. Um, and if it looks like there is some regression of the prescription with an otherwise normal cornea, normal lens, um, we can consider an enhancement if there is a stable prescription. Um, and then just kind of one more note about the epithelial hyperplasia. Um, and this is kind of actually a map on the bottom here of an example of epithelial hyperplasia. You do want to be very careful because let's say you decide to do a PRK enhancement by removing all of that thick epithelium. Um, you, it's very easy to overcorrect the patient um, because that thicker epithelium was likely uh, impacting the refraction as well. So you do have to keep that in mind. And it's an, epithelial mapping is actually really important in these cases. So corneal aberrations um, can happen, and it's important to counsel patients that, you know, immediately after the procedure, it's not uncommon to have some type of halos or 
um, glare potentially around lights that does tend to improve with time. Um, it is associated with higher refractive errors. And also if for whatever reason, the ablation zone during the procedure is on the smaller side, so less than six millimeters, this is pretty uncommon to have that in with modern technology, um, fortunately. Uh, so these symptoms can be most notable in dimmer light or in nighttime, particularly due to the uh, pupil dilation. And so, um, you know, people may um, discuss that, you know, night driving is a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, obviously reassurance and time can help because these do tend to improve. Um, but if a patient is very symptomatic, you could consider using a people constricting agent. Um, one uh, option that I like to use is bromonidine, um, but you could also consider pilocarpine um, as well, or you know maybe even buity. So I just put this slide in here just to be complete, but to be quite honest, it's very rare these days um, with our current technology to be using a microkeratome to create a LASIK fl flap. I personally have never used a microkeratome. I use a femtosecond laser, as do uh, most refractive surgeons. But it's important to know, you know, what complications could potentially arise with the microkeratome. Um, so on the left here, this is a picture depicting what we call a free cap. So basically, the microkeratome actually made um, neglected to make a, a flap, actually severed the hinge. So there's literally just like a free floating. Uh, piece of cornea. You could actually still proceed if you're very careful in orienting that free cap back where it belongs. You can still use the eczema laser to ablate and then put the um, free cap back on. I would put a bandage contact lens to kind of make sure it stays in place. Um, but patients could do well with this scenario. Um, in the middle here, we see an example of where the microkeratome seems to have failed to make a complete flap. In this instance, I would not proceed um, and I would not even touch or, um, or lift the flap and just wait three months and perhaps either do PRK or consider doing LASIK flap at a different uh, uh, flap thickness. And then on the right here, we have an example of what we call a buttonhole. Um, so this is more common if um, the cornea is a little bit on the steeper side. So you can see here that when it's steeper, there might be a little buckling of the cornea centrally. And so what this results in is a flap where in the center, there actually has not been a cut made. Um, and you do not want to lift that flap because you're going to have an irregular stromal bed. Rather, you'd want to stop and um, wait several months for corneal healing and then probably avoid any LASIK procedure and do a PRK more safely. Um, Central Island is a also pretty uncommon um, phenomenon. Uh, essentially, what's happened is that there's an area centrally that wasn't treated fully, particularly after a myopic ablation. So you might see a little bit of um, central elevation there. It's really not very common with the current laser technology, but with pr uh, previous iterations of the eczema laser um, this could have been caused for, you know, perhaps the laser not getting centrally um, or remnants of the laser kind of depositing centrally and, and preventing further treatment centrally. Or perhaps if there was a wet spot on the cornea, um, that could have prevented the laser from fully treating in the center. You know, in terms of uh, visual issues, it can lead to decreased uh, vision and monocular diplopia. But fortunately, um, with careful monitoring, many will actually regress um, and not cause a huge issue. But let's say this does persist. One option to treat this would be a kind of customized topography guided ablation to even out the irregular topography there. Uh, so decentered ablation is also um, not as common, um, but you know, the main reason why this might happen is if the patient, for whatever reason, is not fixating where they should be during surgery. And we have like means to um, uh, facilitate fixation. Um, so if they're not looking at the right spot, then it could, the laser could be fooled into treating, uh, you know, the incorrect uh, spot. 
or perhaps if the patient isn't positioned properly, for example, tilted to one side or their chin is like really up or down and not kind of planar where it should, the head should be, um, then the laser could be uh, ablating at the incorrect plane. This can be seen more commonly um, with hyperopic ablation. Uh, fortunately, if it's a small decentration, it's usually not visually significant. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, if there is a true decentered ablation, it does not improve on its own. Um, it leads to visual issues like coma. And there are ways non-surgically to potentially see if this will improve the patient's vision. For example, um, uh, a pharmacologic agents to constrict the pupil or perhaps a rigid contact lens to help um, improve any irregular astigmatism. Um, but one, you know, surgical way to fix this is to do a customized topography guided ablation to try and even out the uh, corneal surface there. Um, okay, so in terms of, you know, other post-operative uh, findings, so on the cornea, um, Striae. So there's really two types of striae. There's micro striae, which is kind of just partial thickness on the flap up to about Bowman's, versus macro striae, which are these very, you know, full thickness flap folds that are very kind of prominent on examination. Um, you can see it best if you retroilluminate on a slit lamp. And there can be different reasons for striae. Um, if there's excessive rubbing, let's say post-operative day one, um, you know, trauma even um, years after the procedure. Um, when you're taking away more tissue, like high ablation, this could be a risk factor for striae. Um, and then, you know, if the flap, if you either overhydrate or um, it desiccates, this can lead to kind of an abnormal flap architecture, which might be more prone to folding or contracture. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times patients may have symptoms that can clue you into something, you know, somewhat abnormal, like pain or tearing or reduced vision. Um, and so we have to kind of differenti differentiate, number one, if it's micro or macro striae. If it's micro striae and it's not visually significant, let's say it's peripheral um, and they're having no symptoms, then it could actually be monitored. Um, whereas if it's clearly macro striae with visual symptoms, uh, you want to intervene quickly so that the full, the striae don't become permanent. Um, so you'll want to go back in surgically and reposition the flap, kind of smooth it out and put a bandage contact lens to help facilitate um, the proper positioning. And so this is a slit lamp photo here of an example of macro striae. So again, you see these kind of large, full thickness uh, flap folds that are definitely prominent, as you see on retro illumination. And then this is a uh, pentacam here, which uh, can clearly show that there's some corneal irregularity there. Um, epithelial ingrowth um, can definitely happen. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, and, and so essentially what's happening here is that there's some irregularity on the epithelial surface that's allowing for um, uh, basically invasion into the interface and, and with proliferation of the epithelial cells, this can result in what we call epithelial ingrowth. And some of the risk factors for this developing are, again, some type of epithelial abnormality, whether it's an epithelial defect, recurrent erosion, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Another common one actually is, is when you do um, an enhancement where you actually relift a pre-existing LASIK flap. That can sometimes be risky. And so we always counsel patients when we're thinking about doing an enhancement such as this, that there is that small risk of reintroducing epithelium into the interface. Um, and actually we, as a practice, choose not to um, lift a flap beyond two to three years after the primary procedure, because that can um, increase the risk of epithelial ingrowth. Um, in terms of like when you can see this, you know, probably it's not as common a couple of days into the surgery. If you're going to see it, it probably happens a couple of weeks after the surgery. Um, and, you know, there's a wide range of symptoms. It can be relatively peripheral and asymptomatic, and you could potentially just monitor it closely. Whereas if, um, you know, it starts to 
you know, documented growth towards the visual access and leading to visual symptoms, um, then you may want to consider actually intervening, lifting and washing out. Uh, so this is a, essentially just a pathological view of what's going on. You have um, superficial epithelial cells that find a track to invade in, essentially the interface, and then they can proliferate um, and grow there. Um, and so again, so, so in terms of when you would want to treat epithelial ingrowth, again, it's when it's um, starting to impact the vision or perhaps also causing, you know, excessive to the point where it's actually leading to some flat melting or, um, you know, irregular astigmatism. Um, and so what you want to do is go ahead and carefully relift the flap and you want to aggressively wash out any of the epithelial cells or nests that have grown there. Um, and then we also um, often uh, use like a crescent blade to scrape the underside of the LASIK flap, as well as the stromal bed to be certain that we're getting all of the epithelial cells um, out. And then um, replacing the flap. And really, you want to tampon on it to prevent more ingrowth. So you can either use a bandage contact lens or maybe even suture or glue. Okay, um, ectasia is a very rare complication of refractive corneal refractive surgery, um, but it is important to know about. Um, you know, what are the risks of ectasia after refractive surgery? Um, well, the more tissue you, you remove, the weaker you make the corneas, the less biomechanically kind of strong it is. Um, and so that's one risk factor if you have like a high ablation. And that's why one, you know, one thing we measure preoperatively is how, what is the predicted residual stromal bed? Because we want to make sure that there's a healthy amount remaining and we're not making it too thin. Um, in our practice, we like to keep the residual stromal bed about 300 microns or greater. So certainly if you're lower, like 250, that could um, somewhat compromise the cornea um, in the future. Also, you know, other risk factors are the younger the patient, if there's a thin pachymetry to begin with. Again, if you're, you know, have a high ablation. And then if there is any pre-existing irregularity on the topography or tomography, like inferior steepening or posterior elevation. Like these are patients who really shouldn't be doing corneal refractive surgery on. I um, mean, it's important to identify these patients preoperatively. Um, in terms of treatment of uh, ectasia from a, a refractive surgery, um, so you know, a rigid gas permeable lens or scleral lens can often help just to improve optical quality, especially if there's irregular astigmatism. Um, but certainly corneal cross-linking um, should be highly considered to halt the progression of ectasia. Intacts are intrastromal corneal ring segments that can be used to kind of flatten um, some of any steepening of the cornea to improve best corrected visual acuity. And if the ectasia is really severe, um, you know, a corneal transplant could be considered, um, such as DALK, which is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, removing a large bulk of the cornea, but preserving some of the posterior stroma and endothelium, or a full thickness uh, transplant, which is a penetrating keratoplasty. But like I mentioned, it, that, that's why it's really important to identify a high-risk cornea preoperatively. So I have a few examples here, um, just kind of highlighting things that you might want to look for um, when you're seeing a patient. Um, so in, in my um, clinic, we have a Pentacam, which I like to use. I think the, um, the helpful thing about a Pentacam being a corneal tomographer is that you can see both the anterior and posterior aspect well. And we in particular like to look at the Balin Ambrosio display um, because it highlights the posterior float, but also um, provides what is called the Balin Ambrosio display score or bad score um, that can often clue you in if, to, uh, if there's any irregularities or concerns or potentially um, higher risk of some type of ectatic process already. Um, so this actually is an example of a normal scan. Um, and so, you know, if a patient presented with this type of 
patentee cam, I wouldn't have any issue um, recommending Smile or LASIK depending on their prescription. Here though, um, uh, what we see here is that there is astigmatism. There is some steepening, as you can see on the anterior surface. It looks fairly regular actually, but then when you look on the left-hand display here at the Balin and Brosio display, um, on the right eye, you can see um, there is some central uh, posterior elevation, I would say mild in the right eye. And when you look at the uh, bottom right here, where, which is the Bell and Ambrosio display, it is yellow kind of indicating that there's some borderline risk. And then when we look at the left side, the posterior uh, elevation looks to be a little bit more moderate. Um, you can see kind of with the heat map here. And similarly, that uh, Bellin score is um, yellow, indicating some borderline, kind of drawing your attention that there's something potentially going on. So if I were to see this, I would definitely um, have my alarm up. And I don't think this is a normal scan. I certainly would not recommend immediate corneal refractive surgery. I would definitely explain to the patient that we are seeing some mild abnormality and we definitely want to monitor it. Um, I would say at least follow up in six months and make sure it's at least not progressing um, before considering the next step. Uh, this is a patient, um, looks like there is a high amount of uh, regular astigmatism. You can see a nice bow tie kind of regular pattern of astigmatism in each eye on the anterior um, float here. And then uh, on the posterior side, actually, it looks very normal. I don't see any significant um, elevation. So actually, this is a regular astigmatism where, you know, a procedure like LASIK would be just fine. I wouldn't have any issues with that. This uh, scan, on the other hand, is definitely concerning. You can certainly see a lot of red here, which is um, one clue. Um, but when you look anteriorly, there's definitely, um, you know, steep cornea. Um, there is some apical thinning as well, which is concerning. And then when certainly when you look on the posterior aspect of the cornea, there's significant posterior elevation in both eyes. Um, and then you can see the Balin score is very red and very high. I think it says 13. Um, so that's a definite clue that there is something, you know, very abnormal with this cornea. Um, and so 100% would not do corneal refractive surgery on this patient. Instead, I would be discussing how uh, corneal cross-linking in both eyes would be very beneficial to halt this process and to also potentially consider uh, you know, in tax, um, depending on the best corrective visual acuity to help improve the vision to some extent. Um, and then this is another example here. We have, it looks like a flat cornea. You can see kind of that blue on the scale. It's like 36, 38. Um, so a bit of a flatter corner cornea than, um, than normal. Um, on the right cornea though, the posterior Poster aspect of the cornea looks fine, green looks pretty good. But on the left side, you can see there's some elevation there. And actually the Bellin score, um, you know, being red indicates there is some abnormality there. So I, you know, in seeing this, I, I would discuss it with the patient and I would caution them on at least maybe monitoring this for now and making sure that this isn't um, getting worse. So yeah, if we monitor it and repeat the scan. Actually, this is actually what happened. We repeated the scan about three months later. And in just three months, you can see that there's actually been some slight uh, progression, slight increase in posterior elevation and also a little bit worse bad score. Um, so it's possible that this is actually worsening and this likely is an ectatic disorder. And instead of discussing corneal refractive surgery, we're actually discussing cross-linking in the left eye and not doing, you know, monitoring the right eye, but not doing any corneal refractive surgery there. So, so using, you know, entities like corneal tomography um, and topography in a preoperative setting can really help us elucidate if there's any, you know, corneal issues, any concerns that we need to discuss with the patient and perhaps avoid 
corneal refractive surgery if there is concern. Um, okay, so just have like a few more slides here. Um, so when we have a PRK patient, obviously we're taking away the epithelium and we expect the epithelium to heal back um, after, in most cases, about a week is when we see generally full um, re-epithelialization. But in certain circumstances, we can see a little bit of delayed healing. Perhaps the patient has severe dry eye or maybe the preservatives in the eye drops are causing some type of medicamentosa effect leading to delayed healing. Um, fortunately, this can be resolved with just a little extra care, lubrication, maybe extended use of the bandage contact lenses or punctal plugs. Um, and with these measures, generally, um, this is fine. This can heal just fine. Um, you know, along those same lines of, you know, other PRK uh, issues, you know, we can see corneal haze, um, you know, anywhere from a couple of weeks after the procedure to a couple of months afterward. Um, and this can lead to, depending on the grade, it can be asymptomatic or it could actually be causing, you know, a change in the vision or maybe even regression. Um, and so the number one way to avoid this is to use mitomycin C in surgery. And that's pretty standard. Um, in practice these days. Um, but, you know, risks of developing corneal haze is if for whatever reason, mitomycin C is not used, or if, you know, there's a higher ablation, a lot of tissue is removed that can increase our risk, or if for whatever reason, they're not using drops, um, particularly steroids. And so we generally can treat corneal haze by you know, putting them on a fairly aggressive regimen of topical steroids and corneal haze tends to um, resolve with the use of steroids. Okay, diffuse lamellar keratitis or DLK is something that we should all know about because, you know, it's very easy to diagnose and if it's caught quickly, it can be treated with a great outcome. You know, the thought process behind as to how this happens is that there is some type of inflammatory re um, response to either, you know, some contaminant on the instruments used during surgery, or maybe some, there was a little bit of bleeding and some red blood cells have gotten into the interface that are leading to inflammation, or maybe even some bacterial products that are then leading to an inflammatory response. A lot of times this can be subtle, but picked up on at the one day post-op. Um, and it's usually caught early. So it usually will happen and be seen within the first 24 hours or up to the first three days of uh, uh, post-operatively. Um, and again, this is a non-infectious process. It's just inflammation. Um, and there's this kind of classic sands of Sahara appearance, which I have some uh, pictures of. And just to kind of reiterate, if we catch it early, there's a very good prognosis. So, you know, we can see these kind of granular, this granular appearance in the interface, um, which is classic for DLK. And there's four stages of DLK. So stage one, what we typically will see is just a very peripheral reaction. Um, as you can see in the picture here, there's generally like, usually the patient's doing just fine. There's not much of, you know, any symptoms, um, whether, you know, foreign body sensation, photophobia, or, you know, minimal impact on the vision itself. At this point, what I would do to treat this would be to increase the steroids, uh, maybe double or triple the frequency. Um, and a lot of times, if you see them the next day, it's pretty much resolved. And what you wanna avoid is it advancing to stage two, which is now we have kind of this central diffuse, um, or sorry, diffuse scattered, um, you know, white blood cells is granular appearance. Again, at this stage, even with a little bit more of a diffuse involvement, there's typically not a huge impact on the vision. So again, I would increase this topical steroids, you know, Q1 hour, Q2 hours. If you hit them hard with steroids, a lot of times that, you know, significantly blunts the inflammatory response and we can avoid going back into uh, the eye. But now we have stage three. So here the difference is we have denser central inflammation where we now have an impact on the vision. And so at this point, 
I would definitely consider doing what we call a washout, where you relift the flap and you irrigate out any of the inflammatory cells um, that are promoting this, you know, DLK response. And then I would use um, uh, aggressive topical steroids, so Q1 hour, Q2 hour, prednisolone, um, and perhaps even consider oral steroids as well with very careful monitoring. And ultimately, we're trying to avoid stage four, which now is not only are, is there central involvement, but there might actually be scarring and melting um, from that in, uh, significant inflammatory response. And obviously, we're going to have decreased vision from this. And the treatment for this can be actually pretty challenging. Um, and so you have to be mindful if you want to go back in to irrigate because there is, you know, sometimes scarring and melting versus, you know, a uh, significant use of steroids. Um, but ultimately, if we can catch the DLK at stage one or two and intervene quickly, we will try to avoid stage three and stage four. Um, now, it's important to be able to differentiate DLK from infectious keratitis. Um, here, you know, this is actually pretty uncommon, um, and there can be a variety of etiologies for this from, you know, lid flora, um, like gram-positive staph and strep, to, you know, atypical bacteria like mycobacteria and such. But, you know, if it looks something like this, which looks like a very hot and angry eye, you know, kind of like how you would deal with other like corneal ulcers, for example, you would want to culture and start broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, let's say if it's a LASIK patient, you could consider lifting the flap and culturing or scraping um, uh, and irrigating with additional antibiotics. One important way to distinguish infectious keratitis from DLK is that infectious keratitis can cross the boundary of the LASIK flap. So it's not confined to the interface, unlike DLK. And then you can actually have what we call sterile infiltrates. So not all infiltrates are necessarily infectious. And this can be seen on occasion, for example, with PRK, um, especially if you have that BCL on for an extended period of time. Um, fortunately, these sterile infiltrates uh, respond very well to increasing steroids, stopping the NSO NSAID and monitoring carefully, and they do just fine. So again, kind of just to reiterate, differentiating DLK versus infectious keratitis, DLK will present earlier on, usually within the first 24 hours, whereas it might take a little, a few more days for infectious keratitis to present. Um, DLK is confined to the interface and generally starts peripherally, whereas infectious keratitis can um, kind of extend beyond the interface or into deeper stroma or superficial, pretty much anywhere. Um, and that's important to differentiate the two. And then we have central toxic keratopathy or CTK, which is very rare. Um, and honestly, it's poorly understood why it happens, um, but it's considered non-inflammatory, but similar to DLK. And it probably is on some type of spectrum with DLK, um, but these are some classic pictures of central toxic keratopathy. You kind of get this central haze, like mud crack appearance. A lot of times this can lead to um, central flattening and melting even of the cornea, which then leads to a uh, hyperopic shift. It can be kind of tricky to treat this rare entity, but what you want to do is number one, differentiate it from DLK. You won't see the classic kind of peripheral sands of Sahara, it will be mostly central, um, and it does not respond to steroids. So you should stop steroids if you think that this is what is going on. And this can take, you know, time to heal on the order of sometimes several months. So um, the main ways to kind of treat this are to try and um, rejuvenate the cornea and keratocytes. You can use autologous serum, tears, you know, punctal plugs, vitamin C. Um, and, and generally, 
time is what, you know, uh, helps to heal this specific entity. Um, okay, and we just have a few more slides here. Um, this is also pretty rare, um, but pressure-induced stromal keratitis or PISC, um, this is a very nice picture of it. Essentially what's happening is that there's elevated uh, intraocular pressure, uh, typically from some type of steroid response. And what happens is aqueous actually goes through into the interface and creates this fluid cleft. Um, and it can actually be somewhat deceiving if you try to just applinate normally into the central cornea because it will just, you're just applinating this clear flu, the aqueous essentially. And so it could very well give you a normal number. But if you actually take a tono pen and you measure the pressure outside of the flap, you'll be surprised what the true pressure is, which is very high. You can also try tactile um, you know, a measurement of pressure to elucidate this. But really, once you identify this, the number one thing is you want to stop or quickly taper off the prednisolone and to start uh, pressure lowering drops. And, and it will resolve um, pretty quickly after that. All right, so those were a lot of the corneal refractive um, complications that may arise. I just have one slide here on the ICL. Um, many of you may be familiar with this technology, but really the, the most important part of the whole procedure for ICL is sizing um, because you want the uh, vault to be appropriate. So the vault is essentially the distance um, from the ICL to the natural crystalline lens. And in an ideal you know, setting, the vault should be anywhere from 250 to 750 microns, or the way we typically gauge it is if you take the uh, central corneal thickness on the slit lamp beam, about one half to one and a half corneal thicknesses. Um, and so let's say, you know, on the left-hand side, bottom left-hand side, this is a picture of a normal vault, but let's say uh, in the middle here, we have a um, a shallow vault. So the ICL is too close to the crystalline lens. Well, the issue here is that it could be touching the natural lens, and this can lead to early cataract formation, most commonly uh, anterior subcapsular cataract. And obviously that's not good. And we either need to remove the lens or perhaps exchange it for a larger sized lens. Um, if it's a toric ICL and the, sh and the vault is really shallow, this can actually promote rotation of the toric ICL, which would then lead to um, an impact on the vision and may either require uh, re-rotation or repositioning of the ICL or perhaps exchanging it to a larger sized ICL. And then on the other hand, if the vault is too high, so the ICL is let's say too far away from the natural crystalline lens, as you can see on the bottom right photo here, um, that could potentially lead to a pupillary block situation. So the pressure um, can go up. Um, fortunately, actually with the Evo ICL with that central port, that is less likely to happen because you still have a area for aqueous to flow. Um, but that's, you know, it could also be too high such that it chafes on the posterior iris and lead to pigmentary issues or dispersion um, or just general pressure issues. So we try to avoid uh, too large of a vault. And, you know, if it is in fact causing a pressure issue um, that can be go ahead, that can be exchanged and um, uh, uh, replaced with a perhaps smaller sized ICO. So those are kind of things that we look for um, when it comes to ICLs and making sure that the sizing is um, as accurate as possible.